As I was thinking this week about what to talk about, I, I, I'm, I keep kind of pushing off this series that I was thinking God just kind of keeps dropping these letters in my mailbox of where we need to go. And we talked about unforgiveness, we talked about faithfulness, and I'm like, well, we're kind of on this theme of churchy words. So I didn't really call this mini series, it's not really a series, churchy words, but that's kind of what we're doing. I'm just kind of like, just kind of picking things that I feel maybe we need to hear. Maybe I haven't spoken on these things in a while. Maybe this is really God prompting us to go in a certain direction. So for this week, we are going to talk about something that probably only affects a very small percentage of us, and that is anxiety and worry. Okay? Worry and anxiety, and I called this message 12 Minutes. Now, that's probably one of the strangest sermon titles that I have ever come up with, 12 minutes. That's not going to make any sense until the end. Now, I don't ever say that I use any gimmicks in preaching. I don't think there is like this one size cure. I mean, there's the gospel, so there, that is kind of a thing. Uh, but for, you know, a lot of the stuff in God's word, I don't think there is just a lot of, if you just do this, it'll fix everything right away. But if there was one of those messages, today actually might be one of those. And I came across something in my studies this week, and I totally geeked out on it, okay? I, I'm, I'm not like a scholar or anything, but I, I kind of do like science a little bit. Any science people out there, you can put your hand up. Okay, cool, great. I'm so glad some people raised their hand. We're going to get into a little bit of science today. Uh, actually, we're going to get into a lot of science, but... Um, so by raise of hands, just to make sure that we're all on the same page or to make sure you're awake, has anyone ever suffered from worry or anxiety in the past or maybe right now? I already have people with two hands up. Anybody? Put your hand up. Okay. Pretty much everybody or you're not paying attention or you were raised in a Baptist church and we just don't raise our hands in church. Sorry. That's a church joke. All right. Pastor Craig Groeschel, I, I really, really admire Craig Groeschel's uh, pastoring and preaching and leadership. He says this, he says, most of life's battles are won or lost in the mind. That's so true, isn't it? Most of our battles, and, and, it's, and it's really, we can look at anything that we're going to try to accomplish. If you're going to try to set a record or do something, like I love going to the gym, and, and, and we, we did some heavy lifting, and I already knew before I stepped to the bar if I was going to accomplish that lift or not, because it was all in my head. All of life's battles are won or lost in the mind. Here's another one. A positive life and a negative mind rarely go together. It's pretty true, isn't it? Here's one more. Worry and worship cannot exist in the same heart. That's a big one. Worry and worship. We all, as Christians, we call ourselves worshipers, but this thing of worry and worship, they're constantly clashing each other. And I really don't believe they can exist, or at least not well, within the same heart. So here's a question. Why does worry and anxiety seem so natural for us? Especially irrational. Anybody, just you don't have to raise your hand on this, but have you ever worried or had anxiety irrationally? Like, like here's a scenario. You ever left the house and you're driving down the road, and you're like, oh, I forgot deodorant. Okay? Just me? Okay. I keep deodorant in my backpack, just, just so you guys know. Okay? So you're like, and, you, and then you do that thing. You're like, <sighs> right? So you're, you're, you're going. You're like, oh, my goodness. I forgot deodorant. I'm going to stink today. And if I stink today... I'm probably not going to get the job that I'm interviewing for because I stink. And if I don't get the job that I'm interviewing for because I stink, I'm probably going to have to take a job at McDonald's as a fry cook. Now, no 
criticism on anybody that I, I worked at McDonald's. I was a system manager. I'm just saying that. But you're probably going to have to take a job as a fry cook at McDonald's because you didn't get the job that you were interviewing for because you stink because you forgot deodorant. And, well, if you don't get that job, you know, the good job, and you have to work as a fry cook, you're probably not going to meet the girl of your dreams. And if you don't meet the girl of your dreams, then it means you're going to meet Mrs. Wrong. And, well, let's face it, she probably doesn't wear deodorant either. And, and then with Mrs. Wrong, you're going to have the wrong kids. I don't even know if that's possible. But that's going to happen, right? Because we're irrationally thinking. And if you have the wrong kids, they're going to drive you nuts. And there's going to be times where you're going to have to just leave the house because you can't take it anymore. And you, you have to leave the house because the kids are driving you nuts because you got the wrong kids because you married Mrs. Wrong because you're a fry cook and because you stink because you didn't wear deodorant. So you're out driving and you're speeding because you're freaking out and you get pulled over by the cops. So then you get pulled over by the cops because you're speeding because of all of these other problems and, and you're fired up and you're irrational and you start acting crazy to the cop and you get arrested and you're now going to jail. And by the way, by this time you have a headache. And you know what? You now probably have a brain tumor because you have a headache, right? Now, I'm being a little bit sarcastic here, a little bit irrational but am I? I mean, have we ever really gone there? We probably have, haven't we? We probably, one little thing, I forgot deodorant. Next thing you know, I'm in jail with a brain tumor. Like, why do our brains do that? By the way, do you know why the brain experiences so much anxiety? Because it's part of the nervous system. <laughs> Cheers. So in case you're new here, <clears throat> or you're visiting, <laughs> if you look up churches in the Keys, there's like this stigma about the funny pastor that has the amazing jokes. I just want to let you know that's me. Right, church? See? They agree. They don't laugh at my jokes, but at least they agree when I ask them for a shout. All right. Philippians chapter 4. They're like, is he ever going to get to the Bible? Yes. Philippians chapter 4. I want to read through our passage. We're going to talk a bunch of geeky science stuff, and then we're going to break down this passage. So Philippians chapter 4, it's real easy to find. It's right after Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. If you've uh, got a Bible, great. You can use your phone. I won't call you out. There's a Bible right in front of you. If you don't own a Bible, you are welcome to take that Bible in front of you. Take it home. Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. It says, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, Whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Think about those things, the things that are excellent and praiseworthy. Now to the science part. In our brains, there is this thing called an amygdala. Anybody ever heard of your amygdala? Okay, a few science people in here. Okay, so the amygdala, it's this little almond shape thing inside of our brain, and it's involved with the experiencing of emotions. Where that irrational fear, worry, anxiety, that normally starts in our amygdala. The amygdala is the fight or flight portion of your brain. That's how God created us. Like, 
When you get surprised or threatened or something happens, your amygdala kicks in, sends uh, all of these signals to other parts of your body, and your body sends all of this adrenaline throughout your body or epinephrine. And next thing you know, you're like, your, your senses are heightened, your heart's pounding through your chest, and that happens in a moment. It all starts in your amygdala. Like you suddenly, you get woken up in the middle of the night and you just totally freak out. That's your amygdala just going absolutely berserk. Now, I've, I've told this story before, but it's, it's been a while. Um, maybe about 10 years ago, um, we were sleeping. It was probably about 3 a.m. And I don't know why, but all of a sudden, I, maybe I heard something I, I woke up and, and I just opened my eyes. Now, at the, towards the foot of our bed, there's a window. And the moon was, was really bright that night, and so you could kind of see through it. And as I opened my eyes, there was this large figure, this person standing in my room. Now, as the strong, secure, you know, guardian of the home, what did I do? I started screaming like a little girl, <clears throat> just being honest. So I start just, ah, ah, ah. I, I don't know what I thought I was accomplishing. Maybe I was trying to scare this person out of the room or something. And so, of course, I wake up Nikki. And she sees it, and she yells, don't judge. She says, Trevor, get your gun. Don't judge me, okay? So, but see, Nikki's the sensible one in the family. Nikki's the one that really comes up with a plan. So in about 0.3 seconds, she has this idea. Okay, I know that there's a dumbbell under the bed. I'm going to grab the dumbbell, and I'm going to attack this person and give Trevor enough time to neutralize the threat, right? She has all of this worked out. I'm still screaming. <clears throat> All of a sudden, when I mean, and this happens in a split second, we hear, it's Lacey, it's Lacey, it's Lacey. My older daughter, Lacey, and she was probably 13 or so at the time, it was her. Now I'm like, no, it can't be Lacey. What happened was because we were laying down in bed, kind of looking up, and there was the moonlight and the shadow, she came in with her blanket over top of her. So she's like this, and we're looking up at her, and it looks like this massive figure. Now, was there a real threat there? No, pretty sure I could have taken out my 60-pound daughter, all right? There was no real threat. However, my amygdala didn't think so. My amygdala was like, there's somebody in your house, scream. Nikki's amygdala was like, all right, we're going to take care of this thing. So that's what happens. Now, there is this thing called an amygdala hijack, and that's what happened. The amygdala hijack is an emotional response that is immediate, overwhelming, and out of measure with the actual stimulus because it has triggered a much more significant emotional threat. That was an amygdala hijack. That was something that just, it, it was irrational. There really was no threat, but in, in our minds, there was a threat. Now, translate that into anxiety and worry. Oftentimes, and I'm gonna beat up this example, Oftentimes, we've only forgotten deodorant. But where does our brain take us? Amygdala hijack. It takes us to this place that, I mean, we're going to jail and we have a brain tumor. That's what often happens when we allow our minds to go there, when we are not giving things to God. See, God gave us this little portion of our brain to protect us but it's hardwired to kick in whether the situation is real or not. That's what our amygdala does. God gave us that thing. But be, before you go on thinking, before I paint too much of a picture like, well, God made a mistake. He, he went a, a little bit 
too far in that. There's another part of our brain. Anybody know what the counterpart of that is called? Any real science nerds in here? It's called the prefrontal cortex. The prefrontal cortex, that's the logical thinking part of your brain. It's basically the complete opposite of your amygdala. The amygdala says, there's noise in the kitchen in the middle of the night, you're going to die. That's what our amygdala says. The prefrontal cortex says, you're not going to die, it's probably just the dishes shifting in the strainer. Anybody else ever had that before? That totally freaks you out. Or, you know, something's going on. There must be a simple explanation to what's going on. The prefrontal cortex. Or maybe when you were a child, you had a bad experience with a dog. Maybe you got bit by a dog or something. So whenever you see a dog, you're, you just get super tense and you get freaked out. And you're like, oh my goodness, this dog is going to attack me and eat me. That's what your amygdala says. And your prefrontal cortex kicks in and says, no, it's not going to eat you. It's a chihuahua. You could punt it across the room. Okay? Now, I'm not advocating for violence against animals, but I'm just saying, if you wanted to, you could kick in and you could defend yourself. Amygdala says, this dog's going to eat me. Prefrontal cortex says, no, it's a chihuahua. You could take it out. So you see this kind of, this, this, this knocking of heads on these two parts of our brain. Amygdala is all panic. Prefrontal cortex is all logic. Now, I want to be very clear. I don't want to downplay ever any trauma that has ever happened to you in your life. I understand that, that, that with as many people in this room, we have gone through some trauma. And I don't ever, ever, ever want to downplay or belittle that. But I want to warn us, every single one of us, about allowing those past experiences to dictate what happens in the future. See, because we have a God that's big enough that can take those things. Are, are we still gonna have the memories? Yes, we talked about this just a couple of weeks ago. Is there still gonna be pain? Yes. But we have a God that wants to walk us through that. So, here's the problem. Biologically speaking, now we're going to kind of bring this back into the spiritual realm. Biologically speaking, if you live your life always worried and anxious about every little possible thing that has or could go wrong, what are you doing? You are constantly engaging your amygdala, making your body think that there is a real threat, whether or not there really is. That's biologically speaking. And we'll get into this more scientifically here in a few minutes. But when you are constantly worried and overreacting about things, your amygdala, you're, you're just ramping it up and it's like working out a muscle. That's biologically speaking. Now, spiritually speaking, if you live your life always worried and anxious about every little possible thing that has or could go wrong, what are you doing? You are assuming responsibility for a solution for something that should have already been given over to God. That's what you are doing. When you are worrying about things spiritually speaking, you are saying, no, no, God, I'm taking responsibility of this. Now, the words coming out of your mouth is, God, I want to give this to you. But when you worry about it, you are taking it back from God or you never really gave it to him. And you're saying, no, 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 God, I'm going to take responsibility to solve this thing. And God's going, just give it to me. And you're like, no, God, I want to give this to you, but I'm going to hold it and I'm not going to give it to you, God. And see, there's a problem there. So consequently, you are not allowing God to step in and do what he wants to do, which is guide, direct, comfort, fix, teach, or assist you through that situation. That's what God wants to step in and do. And when we have this worry and these anxious thoughts and, and we're just not fully giving it over to God, we're taking responsibility for it. We're saying, no, 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 God, I know that you tell me 
that you want to walk me through this? But I, I, I'm, I'm just not going to let you because I can, has anybody ever worried their way out of something? I don't think so. I don't think so. Now, is there concern about things? Are there things that we, we can actually do something about it? Yes, we should have concern about things. But not to a point at 3 a.m. or 3 p.m. for that matter. Or just constantly being on our minds and just plaguing us with these thoughts. Now, side note, I am not speaking about anxiety as far as the medical term. Like, I know that there are anxiety attacks, panic attacks. Those are medical conditions. Those are treatable by medicine. I, I am not talking about that. I'm talking about anxiety in the form of worry when we are just constantly have our minds on something and God is saying just give it to me give it to me I will take it so Paul back to Philippians Paul sitting in a Roman prison or on house arrest basically probably awaiting the death penalty wrote these words in Philippians chapter 4 now again, we have to understand what Paul is trying to tell us because what we want to do is we're going to say, yes, but you don't understand my situation. And Paul's going, I think I can one-up you. I'm in jail awaiting trial that I'm probably going to lose my head. Now tell me your problems. That's, that's the attitude that Paul could have. Now he doesn't, but he speaks from authority here. So Philippians 4, 4, he says, rejoice in the Lord when things are good. Rejoice in the Lord when I have no problems. Rejoice in the Lord what? Always. And then he does that thing. I love this. He backs up and says it again. I will say it again, just in case you didn't get it the first time. I mean, it's like four or five words, but in case you didn't get it, I will say it again rejoice that's a big ask that is a huge statement rejoice in the Lord always I will say it again rejoice there is no exceptions no oh let me tell you my story no and, and again I'm not downplaying the things that are going on in your life but according to this verse no exceptions always Verse 5, let your gentleness be evident to all, 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 the Lord is near. Now that seems like an odd thing to say unless you know his next words. Verse 6, and here's the one we're going to break down. Do not be anxious about anything. There's another one of those just words. Now, if you look at it actually back in the Greek, the, the word that they use is not anything, it's nothing. And, and you would translate it, be anxious for nothing, as maybe some of your translations say. That word nothing, it means nothing, but it also means no one. So I think it's interesting to know that Paul uses this word that says, don't be anxious for anything or anybody. No exceptions whatsoever. Do not be anxious about anything, but in what? Every situation. We're two and a half verses in on our passage, and we have four absolutes already. Rejoice in the Lord always. Let your gentleness be evident to all. Do not be anxious about anything or nothing, and but in every situation. I think Paul's being very clear here by using four absolutes in two and a half verses. There are no exceptions, no excuses. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, how? By prayer and petition. By going straight to God, not by sitting up all night and thinking about them, not by worrying about them, not by whatever, by prayer and petition. Well, how do we do that? We're giving it all to God, allowing him to own it with thanksgiving. Now, this doesn't mean like 
turkey and mashed potatoes Thanksgiving. It means the giving of thanks. The, the word is Eucharistia. It's thankfulness or giving of thanks. Now, again, we would go, Paul, that's a very strange thing to say when we're talking about anxiety and worry and the troubles of our lives. How can you ask me to give thanks during that time? Well, see, I don't think Paul was commanding us to give thanks about our problems. What I think Paul meant by with thanksgiving means, hey, number one, recognize what you already have. Look at the things that you do have, the, the things that are going well in your life. And number two, even better, look at the fact that you have a good God who wants to walk you through this. A good God that you can actually go to and express this fear and this anxiety and this worry and all this junk. That's how we can be thankful through this. That we have a good God that wants to walk us through this. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. So then, we kind of have this road map, right, of how this is supposed to go. And after you've done those things, you do it right, you fully give it to God, watch what happens. Verse 7, and the peace of God. Everybody say peace of God. That's some good, good peace right there. Because he is the God of peace. The God of peace will give us peace. And the peace of God, which transcends, or some translations say, surpasses, or just is greater than, extends past all understanding. This is so much peace, like, like you can't even comprehend it. Like, where did this peace come from? I don't get it. I don't know how I have peace in this situation. That's the kind of peace that it's talking about. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your what? And your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, I, I've mentioned this to you guys before, and I actually talked about it in men's group on Wednesday night, which commercial. Um, we have men's group on the second and fourth Wednesdays of each month. If you are a man, congratulations, you qualify. Um, and so we're, we're doing this Bible study on the nine attributes of a man. <clears throat> and I was talking, we, we were looking at this verse and it had some challenging uh, parts in it. And I said, hey guys, one of the things that you can do is all you have to do is Google the verse and put the word lexicon. And that takes you back to what the original Greek words that are used in this says. So I figured I would do the lexicon on here on verse 7. And I found something very interesting. It says, in the peace of God which transcends all understanding will, what's that next word? Guard your hearts. So it's like, what exactly does that word mean? The word that Paul used is actually a word for a military guard. Think of a group of soldiers, and quite fitting that it's Memorial Day weekend. Think of a group of soldiers protecting something that form a circle around something. You can go back to Roman soldiers back then, or you can think of our soldiers now, but just think about this impenetrable force of soldiers surrounding and protecting something. That's the word that Paul uses, that he says, that peace that God wants to give you will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I don't know if anybody else does, but I would love some of that peace. That's some really good peace. So here Paul is saying, don't be anxious. Don't worry about things. With prayer and petition and thanksgiving, give it over to me and don't take it back. Let me have it. When you do that, I'll give you this peace that you can't even comprehend, you can't understand it, and that peace will guard your heart and your mind through me. That's good stuff, church. That's really good stuff. Now, this last verse, verse 8, we often see this verse or read it as like the standalone verse, and it, and it works for that, like, you know, when we have some, you know, 
thoughts or, you know, some words come out of our mouth. We can use this verse and that's okay. But now I, I want us to think about this next verse that we're going to read in response to the amygdala hijack. When we start having those ramping, anxious thoughts just go crazy in our minds, think about this next verse in that. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. See, it, it, it really, this verse comes to life when we look at it in this context of how we've described it so far. Think about such things. I wrote this down. Make your prefrontal cortex, bring your amygdala into check, and dwell on excellent and praiseworthy things. All right, so let's, let's go back to a little bit of science and we'll wrap this up. So we've talked about some of these scientific things before, but we've talked in the past about neural pathways. Neural pathways. And neural pathways are when you think a thought or you take an action, it's easier to think uh, that thought again or to do that action. Neural pathways, it's actually connections that happen in our brain. And when we think something or do something over and over and over, it creates this pathway in our brain that makes things easier. It can be positive things and it can be negative things. So number one, neural pathways. The second thing is neuroplasticity. I told you we're going to get super scientific here. And neuroplasticity means our brains are constantly changing and rewiring themselves. Now, researchers and scientists used to think that our brains didn't really change uh, past, much past adolescence, but they found that that's not true. So our brains are actually changing and rewiring themselves according to the stimulus that you have, according to the culture that you're in, according to the thoughts that you think, and so your brains are kind of evolving, if I can use that word, or changing, rewiring themselves. Now, one more word, and um, it's neurotheology. Now, before you go skeptic on me, which you would have to fight me for the front of the line to get skeptic on this word when I looked at it. Neuro, neurology, brain, okay? Theology, theo, godology, the study of so, so basically, neurotheology is a field of study that unites brain science and psychology with religious beliefs and practices. Now, I know it seems weird. Let me explain. There's this neuroscientist called Dr. Andrew Newberg, and there's other researchers that they have found that prayer actually changes your brain. So if, if this is true, and we know neuropathways are true, neuroplasticity uh, is true, and our brain changes according to our thoughts and what we do, is it really out of the realm of belief to think that something as powerful as prayer would change our brains? Look at this next picture. This is a, a picture that I Googled of a brain scan. On the left is a baseline brain scan and your attention area, your frontal lobe, and then look at the scan during prayer. See how the brain is kind of fired up there? Now, I just Googled this. I didn't do the research myself, forgive me. But I believe that this is true. There is a, another doctor. Her name is Dr. Carolyn Leaf. She's the author of this book called Switch on Your Brain. And she has done a lot of research to this neuroscientists and all this stuff, and they're finding this out. She says this, it has been found that 12 minutes of daily focused prayer over an eight-week period can change the brain to such an extent that it can be measured on a brain scan. Okay, I'm sorry, I totally geeked out on this. I thought this was so cool. If this is true, that 12 minutes of prayer. Now, let's talk about 12 minutes. Is 12 minutes in the grand scheme of things a long time? No. If you were to go for a 12-minute drive, is that a long time? No. A 12-minute walk, is that a long time? No. 
12 minutes holding your breath, that's definitely a long time. Don't try that. 12 minutes a day of focused prayer. Not like rub-a-dub-dub, thanks for the grub. Not like God bless this food to my body and you're like getting ready to eat pizza or Burger King. Not like that prayer, but like focused prayer prayer where you are giving your worries and anxieties to God, you are thanking him, you are making relationship with him, you are intercessory prayer, praying for others, 12 minutes a day of focused prayer for eight weeks, researchers have found that it changes your brain in such a way it can be recognized on a brain scan. Now, is that cool or what i thought that was really really cool so as i'm thinking about it this week um uh, again i'm totally geeking out and i'm like wait a minute you're a pastor why does this surprise you so much why are you so just in in awe about this and then i started to think are there any bible verses that tell us this Obviously not really about a brain scan, because there wasn't really a brain scan back then. Can anybody think of a Bible verse that actually tells us this is true and this happens? Yeah. How about Romans 12.2? Flipping your Bibles to Romans 12.2. Again, Paul, writing to this church in Rome, he says this. He says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. What, what does the world do? Whatever it wants, number one, but the world worries. The world has anxiety. The world has depression. The world has all of these problems that we don't necessarily get a get out of jail free card, that we don't have to experience those things, but that we can have peace in the midst of those things. That's the difference. So the world can go through all of these things alone. So Paul is saying, hey, don't conform to the pattern of this world. Don't try to do this this stuff like the world is doing and, and go through it on your own without me. Don't sin like them. Don't have anxiety and worry like them, but be transformed, changed into something else, metamorphi, be transformed by how? Renewing of your mind that's exactly what it is saying and now science i love this science has now caught up with the bible science has finally figured out that romans 12 2 and so many other verses are true that we can renew regenerate change neuroplasticity create new neuro pathways in our brains in such a positive way because of 12 minutes of daily focused prayer for eight weeks. Amazing. What a good God. Now, kind of taking it back to our sermon, that's the positive side of it. So what do you think the negative side of worry and anxiety can do to our brains? The same exact thing in a negative way. So here's the challenge. What would it take, I really want you to think about this, what would it take for you to commit to 12 minutes of focused prayer every day? What would it take? Hopefully, it was as simple as hearing this message and going, sign me up for some of that peace that you talk about, Trev. I want some of that, so I will do this. Hopefully, that's you. Maybe if you're like me, sometimes it takes a little more prompting. So here's a challenge. I want you to choose an accountability partner or partners that will hold you accountable for this 12 minutes of daily focused prayer. Now, if you have to, maybe it's your spouse or maybe it's a friend, throw a wager into the equation. So have an accountability partner. You don't have to go into it. You just say, 12 minutes? You're like, yep, 12 minutes, 12 minutes, all right, cool, done. But maybe you have to throw a wager in like, okay, if you miss, you have to do dishes for two nights. Or if I miss, I'll have to wash and vacuum your car. 
Sometimes we have to throw a little bit of stuff. I don't know, friends, guys maybe, I don't know. Uh, if, if you miss, you got to take me out to lunch and, and vice versa, and you got to pay. Or, you know, guys, you know, if, if you miss, I get to punch you in the arm as hard as I can. I, I don't know, I'm, apparently I'm feeling violent today. Um, whatever it takes, I want to challenge you. It's 12 minutes. And not because physically it will change your brain. Think about what that would be like. Think about your life with peace in it that you cannot even fathom. No, your problems don't just go away. But think about if you had complete peace through them. That's what God is offering through this. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you do offer perfect peace and that you want to guard our hearts and our minds to not let that worry and that anxiety and those irrational thoughts creep in. And, and God, I'm, I'm no fool to think that people can just snap their finger and just all of their problems go away, that they'll never worry again, they'll never have anxiety again, but God, I know that you can do that. I know that you can bring peace. So God, help us. Maybe one of the biggest steps is to trust you. God, help us to give these things over to you. God, there may be consequences in some of our actions that we've taken that we're worried about. We get that. God, help us to just, through it all, keep our eyes focused on you. God, thank you that you do bring peace through all of our troubles. And if you're here this morning and you've never had the peace of God in your life, you've never started a relationship with Jesus, I'm going to give you that opportunity this morning. Right now in this moment, if you know, like, I... I, I I just don't have that relationship with Jesus like I need to. Would you just simply be submissive to God right now? Say, Jesus, I need you. I want you in my life. I can't do this on my own any longer. It's not working. So Jesus, come into my life. Be my savior. I trust that you died on the cross for my sins and rose again three days later to prove that you have victory over sin, over death, over hell, and over the grave. Jesus, save me. Jesus, change me. I give you my life. Heads are still bowed, eyes are closed. If you said that this morning for the first time, if you want to start a relationship with Jesus today, will you just slip your hand up? I'm not going to call on you or make any attention. I would just love to celebrate with you. Thank you. Anyone else? Jesus, thank you that you do save and you do change lives. You're not in the business of making bad people good. You're in the business of bringing dead things to life. And I'm so thankful for that, God. Thank you that that is the God that we serve. Thank you that you bring hope. And thank you, God, that you bring ultimate victory. God, we pray for this time of offering. Use it in exciting, amazing ways. God, help us to be a generous church. Thank you, God, for the money that we've raised so far for the Women's Crisis Center in West Palm. God, would you equip them? Do amazing things through them, God. Give them the resources that they need, the people that they need to make eternal differences in this world. Jesus, we love you. We love that you love us. And it is in most 
amazing name of Jesus. We pray. Amen.